we are flashing back to like six months ago, I think, to an interview we had with director Melissa Hayslip about the film Mr. Soul. And we had such an incredible conversation with Melissa that uh, we thought we should revisit it. And plus, it's going to be streaming on HBO Max starting August 1st. And we definitely think that you should take the time to watch this film. Yes, it'll open your mind to just this incredible show that happened that nobody ever talked about, at least in the general uh, media world. And it changed the face of, of TV for that brief period of time. So Melissa was a just so wonderful to talk to. I think we had, this is like extended interview because we didn't want to get off with her, but we're now best friends. Well, I would also say she didn't want to get off with us. So we talked True. about art also. Yeah. Uh, she took I us on a tour of the house. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. So uh, enjoy our interview with Melissa Hayslip and please, please, please uh, put Mr. Soul on your list to watch this weekend. Uh, it comes out August 1st on HBO Max. Thanks for listening. Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear... Rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. So we are so excited to have Melissa Hayslip, who is the writer, producer, director of Mr. Soul, which is one of my favorite documentaries of the year, easily. And you are also the niece of it's the subject character, Mr. Alice Hayslip. So welcome. And, and can you tell us, how this came about, uh, this documentary, and I'm, I'm sure, I mean, you've been his niece your whole life. Did you always <laughs> want to do it? Like, what, what? how long did it take for this, for this documentary to be made? Absolutely. It's been an incredible, incredible journey. Uh, this was a film that we wanted to make, I wanted to make for many, many years, but it seemed to, that it was really important to come out now. Um, this is a story of soul and how soul came to television and this idea of diversity and inclusion and all the things that are important to us now, which were really not even possible after the civil rights and the, the struggle that was happening in America. And this idea that someone could say, you know what, there's more to life out there for people of color. There's art and change and culture and politics. And if you could see this on television, if you gave this actually a platform for visibility, you would see that there is a vast, beautiful um, art and, and, and love. And there's just so much of a cultural push that happens in the black community that all you need to do is just see it. And so Ellis Hazlip decided to bring the, the full black experience to television. And at the time that was really revolutionary because that was not the landscape of television that we knew. And in fact, most images of African-Americans on television were very negative and were tied into the unrest of the time and, and the riots and the poverty and, and people's pushback against, you know, just sort of trying to emerge from that kind of oppression from Jim Crow and, and the heels of the civil rights movement. And so here comes this vision of <laughs> art and culture and music mm. and dance. And it's, it's really revolutionary for television and also for, you know, this is something that's coming into your living room, right? And that's not yeah. something that we knew. And to add to that, color television had just come into being. So the idea of having people of color shown in color, that was actually <laughs> radical. I know it sounds like ridiculous now, but if you put yourself back in that time, you can see that, you know, the, he believed that the revolution would be televised. <laughs> yeah, um, I... I read that this this project took about 10 years. Was it there did. ever was there ever a moment where you're like, is this ever going to be made? Is, are oh, people yes. actually going to see this? <laughs> many, many moments. <laughs> 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 we know what took so long is that we had this very lofty goal that the film should be not just for us, by us, but but for the people, by the people. And so we wanted it to have the same sort of pedigree as the show 
which was funded entirely by grants at the time. And because public television was new and it was receiving um, funding from the government and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and Ford Foundation, we said, let's do that. Let's sort of pay homage to this public space and that and there in is the only way we can be free. And so we set about to fund the film by writing grants, which is a lot harder than we thought. Mm -hmm. And certainly the, you know, gaining that type of public exposure to guarantee a public television broadcast means that you have to write grants that are appropriate for the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And of course we were learning as we went along. So that took a little bit longer because the funding space is very limited mm -hmm. and there's so many projects out there vying for the same thing. So at the same time as we were building it and gaining people's confidence and trying to create a story with the right type of academic spine, you know, historical accuracy mm -hmm. and just like straight funky soul. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was a really important combination of those things, not to mention it's a pretty big story we're telling and there's all this incredible premium music and premium um, performances. You're talking like Earth, Wind, and Fire. I know, the I know, I know. Al, I know. Al, green, Al green. Green. Al green for the first Al yeah. freaking Green. Yeah. You know? well, it's, that's that's so, not a small feat. And so we have right. to figure out, okay, it's a small film, but it's a big heart and a huge story. So we yeah. had to try to figure out how to make that work. And the thing that's unique about us is that we are completely independent. So we weren't relying on a sugar daddy in the corner or, you know, some <laughs> financier or even an angel to show up. It mm -hmm. that never happened for us. So we were just like hitting it hard year after year after year and saying, OK, when one door closes, next one opens. Mm -hmm. And even if it's like, you know, I always say that the name of the film should be Chasing Al Green because that's a whole other story. Like, oh, I mean, I'm, <laughs> yes, I, yes. <laughs> you know, for years trying to get Al Green in an interview or for years trying to get Earth, Wind & Fire. But as we went along and built these relationships and people realized what we were doing, like it took, almost took that amount of time to make people understand, well, this is a great show, but it's like the greatest show you've never heard of. Right. So how do you convince people something is so great when they've never seen it or never heard of it? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like we were doing all those things at once. We were yeah. convinced of this important film and we didn't know it would take so long. But just this idea of convincing people that, you know, this is a story you need to get behind because it's the story of our country. Mm -hmm. It's the story of our nation, you know, and our, our relationships. And um, it, there's so many stakeholders in the film, you know, are activists, artists, poets, people who haven't had their due or people really this idea of like exploring the black arts movement in tandem with the black power movement that hasn't really been done. You know, we saw a black mm -hmm. power mixtape mm -hmm. and we understand right. about the black Panthers, but this sort of intersectionality of mm -hmm. activism and art and black power and, and, and also black women and the movement that they were pushing forward because they were kind of separate from the women's movement mm -hmm. but they also were holding up those movements and there mm -hmm. have been black women holding up all the movements you know right mm -hmm. so there was a lot on our shoulders and um i never anticipated it would take this long but i'm so happy that it's happening now because mm -hmm. we are at a pivotal moment in america where we're finally starting to open up these avenues and really look at what's been holding us back in terms of relationships and, and racism and strictures. And, you know, it's a new day and we are on the eve of a great racial reckoning. And so this is the kind of story that allows us to look back and see what we can learn from those voices, you know, and how we can forge new relationships and new allyships and and, and new, new definitions of ourselves, just like they were reimagining themselves as black people on television. We are sort of reimagining ourselves now. Where will we be in this sort of post pandemic future, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But also how do you learn from that unless you look back? Mm -hmm. So it's just a really exciting time. I know it's an awkward time because we're in this sort of <laughs> pandemic world, but yeah. it's such an uplifting film and it's such a love letter of black culture. And so that, in it's in and of itself is very positive and um that's what excites me is like it's we're just reminding folks of color of their greatness mm -hmm. wow Melissa. yeah so i guess we're done <laughs> I, I need to 
I yeah, need to know. I, I'm just going to go take a nap. You just yeah. filled me with so much. I'm just like, wow, thank you for everything you just said. Uh, that's really empowering. I just, I can't help but think, Melissa, when you talk about your process, that you are really emulating your uncle. You really, you are here to lift up these these voices around you and these artists around you. And, and he was known as the great listener as a documentarian. That's what you do. You listen, you know, and you observe. So you really are emulating in his footsteps and making this film with no filters to make sure you didn't have to answer to anybody. You know, you didn't have to please anybody but yourselves and, and your own, uh, what was true to you. So, uh, so I, I mean, your uncle's proud. I, I mean, we, that's a given, you know, um, he must be real proud of your work, uh, oh, but I want to go back so to much. that relation. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's really powerful. I want to go back to that relationship though. He was living with you as he was hosting this show. Can you yeah. please, were you playing peekaboo with Patty LaBelle? And like, I mean, just tell <laughs> yes. me about living with your uncle during this time. That's insane. <laughs> And it was so insane. And, you know, the thing is that we were very, very close. And he started out, my earliest memories of him were as my babysitter because he was so wonderful and creative and he was safe and, and he loved us as children, me and my, my sister and me. But what was special was that I, I knew that we had a connection and you can see it when you look back at the photos of us when I was little <laughs> and the way I looked at him and the way he looked at me, we knew that there was a bond there. And I also knew that he had very special friends. They seemed magical <laughs> to me. <laughs> I couldn't tell what that was, but he would bring them home after the show at midnight and, and he would he, his favorite meal at midnight was oatmeal with whipped cream and strawberries Ooh. so for me <laughs> that was like breakfast at at midnight so I would come out in my little footy pajamas and try to get under the table and hang out with all these people before my parents caught me and put me <laughs> back in bed but I had this feeling like the way they Ellis held court and the way people responded to him. And, you know, you can see that as a child, you can't quite put your finger on it, but you can feel that energy. And mm -hmm. I think Ellis Hazlip had this feeling about vibrations that mm -hmm. carried through not just the work that he did, but this idea of the vibrations of a community and the vibrations of black love, black strength, black sister and brotherhood. That was em evident in all of his work and, and sort of the footprint, the cultural footprint that he left. And, and it was all, the intention was always love. And you can see that. And so that it was something I felt as a child. I didn't know I was bouncing on James Earl Jones's knee <laughs> <laughs> until my mom told me later on. And I was like, what? <laughs> he was, I remember specifically, because we had finally moved to Connecticut and he was at, in New Haven at the Yale uh, no, the Long Wharf Theater, which is mm. right in New Haven on the waterfront. And he was doing a, or no, I'm sorry. He was at the Yale Rep. That's right. He was at the Yale Rep doing a show, I think a lesson from Aloes or, or some wonderful play. And we heard, and my mother said to me, you know, you used to bounce on his knee when you were a little girl. You should invite him to your, your uh, you know, high school freshman English class. And I was like, what? <laughs> Oh sure. my Denzel God. Jones, you mean Darth Vader? Exactly. <laughs> like I just couldn't, it was, there was so much a disconnect because it was such a special time as a child, but then a big gap happened uh, after, uh, you know, he went on after Seoul and we moved away from New York. And so I made that reconnection. And that's when I learned of all the people that I had been with, including Malcolm X's children, mm. uh, because he was very close to Betty Shabazz and Ellis was safe. You know, Ellis was queer. He was mm -hmm. special. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he had been very good friends with Malcolm X and his wife before Malcolm was assassinated. I know that sounds crazy, but they really were very close and traveled together. And mm -hmm. so when, when after uh, uh, our dear Malcolm was taken, it was very hard for Betty and Ellis was the one who protected her and he still took care of her. He would send a car for her. He brought her onto Seoul a couple of times as a commemor mm -hmm. commemorative show about Malcolm X uh, mm -hmm. on the anniversary. And he brought the children over because it was the perfect play date for me. So I found out later that I was running around under the table again, here, again with the table <laughs> uh, with Malcolm X's children. And to this day, we are still friends. But again, there's that big gap. And then I reached out to them again and I said do you remember me do you remember Ellis Hazlip and they said we remember Ellis because Ellis took care of our mom mm. and you just don't have those kind of relationships today you know 
it's not like you're flossing or clout chasing to say, you know, Ellis Hazel took care of Malcolm X's widow, but that was like the type of relationships that he had. Mm -hmm. And this idea of, and we talk about that in the film and we show photographs from that episode, this idea that he was supporting the wives and the black mm -hmm. women who were the, mar the wives of the, mar or the martyrs of the movement and trying to find a place for women in, mm -hmm. in this, this emerging time when everyone was trying to figure out how to respond, not only to the administration, but to the oppression mm -hmm. that was happening. So for me, all of this was sort of caught up in memory and childhood. But as I grew older, I, uh, my relationship with him changed and he invited me to be his assistant and his sidekick. And so then, th then that was a new kind of relationship because I realized, oh, okay, you've been hanging out with James Baldwin. Okay. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I think I'm oh, going to just like disappear into this conversation and just listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I learned how to listen and to be sort of invisible. And so everyone thought of me as the kid and his favorite niece. And that only became problematic as I started making the film. And they were like, wait, aren't you the kid? <laughs> you know, like, can you really helm this film? Because you're just that, that little niece we saw under the table. Mm. In a way, it helped the relationship over the years. But I sort of had to gain everyone's trust again. Uh, with this, as a filmmaker, because mm -hmm. it's not a story you want to screw up, right? You know, because mm -hmm. there are so many stakeholders. It's not just about Black history, but it's about American history, and it's about you know television broadcast history, and uh, mm -hmm. there's just so much weight in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. I was just talking to Anne right before you came on, and she was like, "So, did you and your fiance watch it?" I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> and I'm like, and it's a lot. It's a lot. It, and, and, and I mean that in, in the best way possible. But I, I wanted to talk with you um, about, about Ellis and um, how special he was. And I, I think he really truly seemed to love himself. And I think he, you couldn't have the show Soul unless someone like him loved himself as much as he did and was confident in himself. So yes. I don't know if you want to talk about that because also yeah. the, the story of him being queer and being out at that time is just like, it's you know, yes. We have to remember folks that it was a very different time. And we, we of this generation where our, our identities and our gender preferences and our, you know, um, our pronouns on our sleeves. It's very different how we are walking through the world and, and being comfortable in our own skin. And so um, the world wasn't as welcoming at that time to same gender loving folks and also people who were non-binary. And the thing that was different around Ellis is that I think he understood that sexuality is fluid and he saw the beauty in that standing in your own truth. And even though homosexuality was forbidden, even in places like, I think in the UK, right up through the seventies, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know the exact date, but it was, it was pretty late. Mm -hmm. You could be arrested, you know, for, mm -hmm. for loving someone. And I, he took great pride in the truth of who, who he was. And the irony is that there's so many folks of all, all different shapes, sizes, uh, preferences, loves, identities in, in, the, in the arts anyway. And so in a way, he was able to further uh, the LGBTQ agenda without announcing it, because obviously he couldn't announce his, his, um, his queerness on TV, but just the fact that he was queer and did not hide that and was very proud of that and was bringing on other folks who were queer and doing wonderful things in the arts, not necessarily outing them the way we would now, but, mm -hmm. but letting them have that platform and putting women out in front. So that was what was really unique about him is that he was not a judgmental person and there was a great love. I think there was a great love for his blackness and his queerness and a, a different sense of what family could be. And there are, are many people in our history who did kind of occupy that space like Bayard Rustin and James Baldwin. And mm -hmm. we are now able to examine them fully, but they may not have been able to live their lives fully at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it's very exciting. And what was challenging for me was to be able to be mindful and respectful of how he lived his life then 
and still make it accessible to a contemporary audience now that feels very differently and very open about mm. about uh, their sexuality and preferences and and uh, representation and all those good things. Mm -hmm. And so we we also wanted to present him in the best light. We wanted him to be a hero. You know, we wanted his queerness to be make him even more of a hero because he's kind of a an unsung hero mm -hmm. and and yet he is a queer icon and it's taken especially the black community a, a lot longer to fall in line with that list of queer black queer icons, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's very exciting that we are sort of becoming more accepting in that way. But yeah. even within the black family and, and not to be judgmental, but just to be honest, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are struggles with that still. Mm -hmm. And because mm -hmm. of the, the way the church is so dominant in our community and the friction sometimes with that. And so to be able to show Ellis's story and how he loved his family and he loved his sort of conservative religious background, but there were also frictions within that and how he still was able to stand in his truth and create opportunities for others. It's yeah. really remarkable. And it speaks mm -hmm. to a duality and sort of a double consciousness that we, we often all lead, whether we're you know, straight or gay or queer or whatever, like these, these dualities of who we want to be and how we're perceived. Mm -hmm. And I think he just wanted to say, blackness is great. Here it is. Yep. <laughs> And yeah. keep all folks who are of color, we need to embrace that and really don't have to apologize for it. And that was revolutionary too, because that was not an option. Let's just put it that way. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On broadcast television, at least. So he was really pushing that envelope in terms of the, the body politic of blackness and inviting everyone to the table. And that it's everything. Yeah, it's all encompassing. Yeah I, yeah, I love that that's how that's one of the points of, of the documentary is that, uh, you know, they were revolutionary, but the having joy, expressing black joy through the pain that they're going through and that they've been through, just ex having that joy was revolutionary in it of itself. Yes. And, and um, and I, I love I love that that was a big part of the, the story. And um, one of the things that I that I was confused by is I'd never heard of this show. Um, and you know, what are, and I was thinking, and I even looked this up to make sure I was right. What were, what are the other variety shows that are happening at this time? It's Ed Sullivan, it's Carol Burnett, which of course I've seen. I love Carol Burnett. Of course I've seen it, but I've never once heard of soul. And it just goes back to, you know, our, what we're taught as history as kids is very Eurocentric. And that, that's the same thing in the media and in TV. And it's just, I hope that a, a side effect of this documentary, a side effect of, <laughs> and no, effect it's true. of this documentary <laughs> is that we all say, we want the show. Let's start streaming it. Let's put it on Netflix. Let's put it out there. I, I want to see it. I want to, I want to look wherever I can find it. So I'm hoping that's one of the things that comes of this documentary. Do you, do you have other, I mean, what are some big goals for you from other than people having Ellis Hazlip as a word that just rolls off the tongue? It's a household name. Oh, that would be a dream come true right there. And it's hard. You know, I know there are a lot of distractions out there. And, but the, the truth is, is it's really important to, to as we are sort of going through this, this, this different time where we're exploring uh, more aspects of our plurality in this country, rather than being sort of individualists, um, I, I like to hope that seeing a show like Soul would show that there has always been like black excellence. It's, it's, it has been seen and it may just be that it was lost in time because it was sort of before this idea of archiving um, live shows. Mm -hmm. But I really hope that in seeing this, that people will realize that we do have so much more in common than we thought we did. And that there is a, uh, there is a universality in, in culture and the way culture moves and changes people. Um, and that's really exciting when you see this wide variety of um, art and culture and politics and love and disagreement. And you see the fulsomeness of a culture displayed so beautifully and the importance of who is telling that story. The fact that it was a black team and a black crew and black producers. And, and so there wasn't this other lens on it in which to sort of interpret blackness, but to say, this roots really for us, by us. 
I think that's important too, as we move forward and bring new voices who can help us reinterpret our history. And as we put people of color back in the narrative and we put women of color back in the narrative, there's been a lot of erasure, I think. And you're speaking of, of, of what we've learned from history. It's more interesting for me to see what we haven't learned because that list is a lot longer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. I, I think of this as like a cultural, a cultural corrective in a way to say, yes, we think we know so much, but there's so much more to the story. And let's not just explore, but celebrate the, all the contributions that we can. And that can have a ripple effect. It's not just black and brown people, you know, let's, let's explore Asian folks and their, their contributions. Let's explore LGBTQ folks and fully vet, give them the platform they deserve. And we all deserve, you know, there's just an intersectionality that I think is needed right now. So for the film, in terms of my hopes for it, well, there are a couple of places that you can see the episodes, which is exciting. Um, if you are a member of Amazon Prime, they have 24 episodes on there. Mm, so oh, you can okay. see okay. 24 original episodes of Soul, which is great. Uh, also, if you don't have Amazon Prime, that's okay. You can look at it on shoutfactory.com, okay. which has a lot of sort of nostalgia television on there. And also Tubi and Pluto. And then some stragglers on YouTube, you know, some mm -hmm. wonderful bootlegs on there too. <laughs> I didn't put them there though. So don't, don't, don't come after me, YouTube police. <laughs> yeah, we just really hope that this film will help motivate and, and, and really elevate the discussion and to really put just best foot forward and really, really help people recognize that, you know, Black has always been beautiful. Right. Black excellence has always been there. And as long as we can recognize that, it, it's less of a frustration about this change. I, everyone, I feel like there's a resistance and there's a resistance of Black Lives Matter and everyone's lives have always mattered and Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. too. So it's just a different approach. And I think this film is very inclusive and because you have this wonderful music that's a soundtrack of all of our lives, and you get to see this sort of time capsule of a very special beginning of a moment with the Black Arts Movement. Mm -hmm. That's really, um, it's, it's really inspiring. And from what I've been told, people feel very inspired after they've seen it and uplifted. And mm -hmm. I think especially now during this rather dark and challenging and uncertain times, you need a good story like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I... Earlier, you mentioned you didn't have any angel, angel investors or, you know, angels in the corner, but um, you did, you do have Blair and Underwood. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, let's talk about angel. And then you also, <laughs> and then, and, and you also, is an angel. Let me yes, say. yes. But, but you also um, had Robert Glasper um, oh, yeah. compose the music. I mean, please talk about both of those oh, fellows. Come on. Yeah. These guys. <laughs> and These pictures guys. would help too if you have pictures. <laughs> oh my gosh. First of all, I don't, it's a dream team because Blair Underwood is such a lovely human. He's just one of the, I've just been in love with him with all due respect to his wife and family. Right, right. Yes. Uh, in, in the most, in the kindest way, most respectful way. Um, and just a big fan of his work. And he has this very unique position in that he's beloved, especially for the work that he's done. And he kind of straddles old school and new school. Mm -hmm. So he he's, uh, has a foot in the past a little bit, but not too far. And this wonderful voice. And he's also a wonderful voiceover artist. And he does a lot of narration. And he does a, a Disney show, uh, like a sequel of The Lion King. So mm -hmm. I knew he was like the best person. We wanted someone to embody the character of Ellis Hayslip so that we could put him in the front of the story. You know, sometimes it's tricky when you have a story about someone who's deceased and you feel like everyone's talking about that person instead of ha giving him agency in the story and being in front of it. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a way to illuminate Ellis Hayslip's thoughts and make his intentions known? And that would sort of give us more of a contemporary timeline like 
we're walking through the story in Ellis's mind as well. Mm -hmm. And so when Blair came on board, he loved the film right away. And I showed it to him and I, I said, this is a really unusual idea because it's, it's a hybrid film in that it's, we're trying to marry, it's a marriage of the history of like the, uh, a story of the, a biography of the show and a biography of the man. And those, those two things don't usually happen in a documentary. Mm -hmm. It's usually one or the other, but I was insistent because I said, we have to just drop in on these five years of soul. And we have to understand how this man put his unique stamp on soul and, and what was it about his personality. So it was very important to weave that throughout uh, to give it sort of a, a, a personal feeling. And I couldn't think of anyone better than Blair, who's such a great actor. And when we did the voiceover session, he was just a pro. I was able to direct him. Oh, wow. And give him all of these. Um, for the last eight years, I had been pulling every quote I could find mm -hmm. that Ellis Hazlip had said in either a, an article in the New York Times or he was always a little looser in the black press. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he, he, he liked to get down in like Jet Magazine and Ebony. I was like, let me look at those. And so the yeah. way he would speak about his feelings about life, his feelings about black culture, you know, he would make these pronouncements like R&B is a floor for black pride. Mm -hmm. When I saw that, I was like, whoa, let me just let that sink in. R&B is a floor for black pride. And that just gave me a whole nother idea about the meaning of music to black people. Mm. And, and, and it, it confirmed for me that music had to be treated like a character in the film. And so it changed my approach to how we scored the film. And that's why I brought on Robert Glasper. Because I Robert mean. is <laughs> just, first of all, he's brilliant yeah. beyond recognition. He is also very agile. So he can flip in between eras, styles. And he's one of those artists, one of those musicians who if you tell him, hey, you know, I need a little vibe here that sounds like, you know, a little Miles Davis maiden voyage, 1972. Hmm. And he'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah, we'll put a few changes here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, got it. And then he'd go into <laughs> the studio and bang out an original song on the first take wow. with an entire <laughs> band. He's and I was pro. like, excuse me, there's no sheet music in there. How did you just do that? It was just mind blowing as we had two days to, to, to write the score on the spot. But two days, two days. Two days. Sorry. And I kept thinking, you know, he showed up and I was, you know, I'm a musician too. So I was like, I oh, don't okay. see any Of course sheet. you are. Yeah, of course any, you are. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see any sheet music. Um, and you guys haven't had any rehearsal. Um, you know, we booked time at, uh, at the studio and I was sweating bullets because we had like, I don't know, 126 cues or something like crazy wow. like that. And so we had to decide which ones were going to be the score, which ones were going to be original songs and which ones were going to be, you know, putting it together like the soundtrack of our lives. And he was just a genius and he yeah. understood what we needed and he understood the 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 time, the era, and the sound. So if I said, I need a hero song for Ellis, it sounds like Curtis, Curtis Mayfield, mm. you know, from Oof. the Superfly yeah. soundtrack. Can you do that? And he's like, got it. And then we just Ooh. go in there and do it. Yes. <laughs> and I also knew that I love the way, because he's young, but he's got an old soul. And he Very also so, yeah. loves to collaborate with people. So I was like, who are you going to bring in? Can we get Common? Can we get Layla Hathaway? Can we get Bilal? Like who you got? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so he brought in Layla, and yes. I was like, "Oh, that's dope!" Because she's yes. like the first daughter of Soul, being yes. Donnie's Jesus. daughter. Yes. Wow. And I was like, "Okay, mind blown." So why don't we do this? I'm gonna start the film with Donnie Hathaway singing "The Ghetto," and then mm -hmm. we're gonna end the film with a new song with <laughs> Layla Hathaway singing, you know, "Show Me Your Soul," which is a song that they wrote just for the mm. film. Wow. And it, you know, it's things like this that like wouldn't happen any other way unless mm -hmm. right. you had someone who was operating on that frequency. But, you know, the thing about Robert was I never really knew where that frequency was. Yeah. <laughs> he's otherworldly. Well, yeah. You don't have to just sit back and watch. No, exactly. <laughs> all, I'll tell you a funny story. Like when he showed up for the first washdown, I was so nervous. So he came to our studio and we had, I had scored the whole film myself and put in all the, um, what we call temp music. 
So like if I had my way, what songs that I know from this era mm. would I use for the soundtrack? It would all be, you know, songs that already exist and really expensive songs. Like forget about getting a Miles Davis song, just forget it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I'll put it in there so you can see what the vibe is. So mm -hmm. I had scored the whole thing and I was sitting there just sweating bullets, trying to look cool. And he was watching with our music supervisor and our music editor, two amazing people. Todd Kaysal, our music editor, first one, and, um, and Ed Gerard is a wonderful music supervisor. Uh, and together, Ed Gerard had brought me, Robert, because they had worked on the soundtrack for um, the Miles Davis film called Miles Ahead, which uh -huh. was a film that was not a, uh, not a documentary, but an actual film hmm. with Don Cheadle playing the role of Miles yes. Davis a few years ago. Mm -hmm, yeah. They had actually won the Grammy for best compilation soundtrack so I was like hmm that sounds like a good team to have yeah yeah <laughs> and so when they came in and sat in and I was so nervous and we started up the film and I had the whole cue sheet written out for them and they were like oh lofty goal look at all those songs <laughs> within five minutes Robert ran out of the room and picked up his phone and I got so nervous I was like oh you know he's probably like super famous getting all kinds of calls <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll pause it, see if he comes back. He's probably gonna have to leave. You know, I started yes. just second guessing myself, like, oh, Melissa, what, ooh, why? And, <laughs> and, I, and I went out into the hallway to see if he needed anything. Could I order lunch for him, you know, make him stay or, or <laughs> coffee, tea? And he was singing. He was singing into the phone. So he wasn't on the phone. He was singing into the phone. And then he just looked at me and he's like, I have the song idea, I'm composing. Oh and I God. was like, <laughs> 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 you know, here I was stressed that I didn't have the right cookies on the table. Right. You know? <laughs> and my dude is out in the hallway composing already from so inspired by what he's seeing. Mm -hmm. That, <sighs> that's just an example of like oh my god this is so meant to be mm -hmm. right? and you just yep. don't know you just don't know how artists are going to respond but it hit him viscerally and he got it and and it sounds like ellis hayslip was just planting seeds all around and then when you needed something those seeds came to fruition you know it's just right. it was like a, it sounds like it was like a family affair you know i really feel that way and i feel that because the intentions were good and we stuck with it for so long and mm -hmm. we never gave up hope and we never, you know, there were a couple of times and we could have made some wrong decisions or given up and something kept us going the whole time. And I really do believe that it was this belief that the, no matter what, and this is what I say to anybody out there who has a dream, you know, you have to hold on to those dreams because those dreams might be your legacy or they might be your future or they might be some other destiny that you don't even know, you know? Why was I banging myself, my head against the wall for 10 years and, and filled with so much doubt because people would say, you're not gonna be able to pull that off, you know? All the time they told me that. Like, you should let Ken Burns do that or, or turn it into a series. No, and, you know, no, 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 no. No, but I'm serious. Like, yeah. that's what I got. Because of course you did. Like, I was yeah. like, pay no attention to this. Just understand that the story mm. is important and believe in the story. Right. And so I, my whole 10 years was about getting people to believe in the story and, and not even recognizing how much of that was me. I just felt mm. like I was pushing the culture forward, pushing the story forward, which is kind of what Ellis was always doing. He never yeah. wanted mm -hmm. to take credit. Yep. You know, he wasn't a baller. He was not out here clout chasing, as they say today. Mm -hmm. He just loved the art and the culture. And he knew, he, he always saw, he was like an Afrofuturist, right? Yeah. It's like he saw the betterment of what was to come for everyone mm -hmm. and, and would always mm -hmm. notch it up. Like Ashford and Simpson, he was like, yes. you know, they were actually songwriters like contracted by Motown to write for Tammy Terrell and, mm -hmm. and, and Marvin Gaye. They were not actually a couple. They weren't married. They had never sung together. They never even sung their own music. And Ellis literally said, no, you're the act. 
wow. forget Motown. Like right. this is your music. You should do it yourself. That's why when you hear reach out and touch somebody's hand, that's the song that they wrote. But you know, the Supremes, Diana Ross and the Supremes mm-hmm. made it famous, but it was their song. They never performed it until soul, hmm. which is wild. And Ella said, I'm going to give you a whole show. You're going to have like 10 costume changes. <laughs> Ooh, yes. <laughs> and love. We're, we're going to get it right. We're going to bring the folks from the church, get the band together. He used to love, I think he had a major crush on um, Nick Ashford. He oh, wow. said he looked like black Jesus. Yeah, so, he did. He totally did. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I heard all the other stuff that was is not fit to say on this. Right I mean, it's called bitch talk. I mean, yes, <laughs> this is exactly where you say yeah. those things. Oh, okay, well, let's just say that he was in love with Mr. Ashford, and so uh, I heard a lot of uh, things I probably shouldn't have heard as a young girl. <laughs> You were getting the complete education. Yes. You yes. Know? It was definitely unfiltered. I think you forgot a couple of times. I, I managed to make myself invisible enough that- You were under the table? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that table. But he, you know, because he was also uh, James Baldwin's lover, you know, like there was a lot there. He was fully in the life. And I love it. These were I, and real yeah. relationships and they weren't relationships for clout. They were relationships for relationships because mm-hmm. it was hard enough to be a black man at mm-hmm. that moment, let alone right. a black gay man, right? right. Mm-hmm. So when you find that th- those pockets of love, that's the only thing you have. And seeing what James Baldwin was doing, I mean, just to be able to take Nikki Giovanni mm-hmm. to London right. and record that incredible conversation, mm-hmm. which is now like, you know, gone viral on the internet and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That kind of foresight, see that, that could have been Ellis. He could have been doing that interview because he was the host of the show, but instead he gave that opportunity to Nikki Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to have her be, to see that they were kind of like mentor and mentee uh, and, and to have this conversation that turns out to be so beautiful and so revelatory. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. But the fact that he had the foresight to not do that himself and the generosity. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is really unique. Because yeah. as, as we say in the film, he wasn't like, um, you know, a, the way Johnny Carson show was about Johnny Carson. Mm-hmm. Soul was really about pushing the culture forward and introducing old artists and new artists, not just Stevie Wonder, but some of the new artists like The Last Poets or, right. you know, um, a young group called Black Ivory. It turns out to be I this know, I love that book. group. But I was like, <laughs> I never heard them before this dog well, they, so were they were in high school i know they're babies and the <laughs> outfits babies. i mean yes. whoever was costume designing was oh, oh it was too much you yeah. don't awards that's <laughs> awards for a lot of things yes yeah. you know and the re- there's only one episode from the first season that exists and it was because they submitted it for an emmy it was the fifth episode. Uh, it was the one with the rather raunchy Last Poets oh, performance. Yes. Yeah. And, but yeah. thank God they did submit it because it's the only episode that has remained intact from that first season. Wow. Um, the whole entire episode. This was they hadn't, as I said before, they hadn't brought on this. The whole nation hadn't really conceived this idea of archiving live shows or yeah. live sports. Right. You know, there was this idea like, if you've seen mm-hmm. it, why do you want to see it again? Mm-hmm. Of course, ESPN has changed that. <laughs> totally, yeah. 100%. We all know about you know classic games that you can yeah. see, but this idea of culture being well, it's fleeting, and and this also this other idea. I hate to bring it up, but you know this idea of um, uh, how, how do you how do you ascribe value to mm. culture, and and the idea that blackness really wasn't valuable or valued. In, a, in certain and many circles in our country at that moment. And so this idea of this phenomenal array of black talent just wasn't considered valuable at first as a television show. And I lament that because <laughs> some of the worst, the worst discoveries were the best episodes that were lost. Mm-hmm. But you know, that's part of the story and mm-hmm. part of the evolution. And as the show got better, the stars got bigger and sexier mm-hmm. and Ellis became a better host and yeah by the time it came to the end you know they were just balling yeah for yeah. within reason you know 
You right. can only ball so much until you get canceled <laughs> 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 from oh. the president. <laughs> I mean, Nixon, geez. Yeah. I know, right? Oh my God. Add it to his list of flaws. Oh my God. The, long, <laughs> the, the list, very long list. The long list of, yeah. Well, even how, sorry, I, we've taken up so much of your time. I really I'm loving it. it. Yeah. I'll be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll too- come back anytime. Okay. Right. I love to hang out. Cool. I have two questions because <laughs> yes, I'm ma'am. looking behind you. The painting, oh. please. Oh. I want you to talk about that. And also, is yes. that a box behind you or is that a piano or neither? That Where, brown? What do you see? The brown, oh, or is it right just here? a shelf? Yeah. That's a, um, oh, that's the, that's the, um, the fireplace. Oh, I oh, thought it was okay. a jukebox. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, wow. There. That, there's a piano. Okay, oh, there's the piano. There's well, a piano. Yes. <laughs> so you're, you're a, a musician as well. And, yeah. um, and do you sing and do you fly? I mean, what else can you do? I don't know. <laughs> You teleport yet or what? Yeah, I yeah. Would, no, but if you figure that out, man, I know exactly the time I want to go back to. <laughs> to the painting, maybe? Tell me about no, the painting. I'm that's, obsessed with yeah, that painting. This is so crazy. You're not going to believe this. Okay, so this is my favorite new artist. Okay. This is an artist named Fabiola Jean Louis. Okay. She is a badass. Can I say that? Yes. yes. Bitch talk. Okay. It's a podcast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> She is such a badass. She's a a young Haitian artist. She lives in New York. She has a killer studio right in the Bronx, the Boogie Down Bronx. And I discovered her, I was working with a printer who was helping us do all of our sort of up our images and fixing all of our, um, anything that needed to be printed or, or, or fixed, especially the digital imaging. You know, we had a lot of old photographs and try to up everything to 4k for the film. And he showed me some work by this artist he was working with. And I'm like, what is that? Yes. Because I was our history major in, in college. I'm like, I spent a lifetime looking for images of black women and black yes. people in the, in art history. And with the exception of like one freaking Rembrandt, there's like no <laughs> black people oh, in, in art. And yep. it, unless it's art of, from the diaspora and it's, you know, right. the African art, et cetera. And he said, no, you're never going to believe this. What she does, and you should go to her website to see, it's fabiolajeanlouis.com, is she is a multidisciplinary artist, and she makes, she creates an image that's actually, what you're looking at is a photograph made to look painterly. <gasps> oh, so it's not a wow. painting at all, wow. but it's a photograph and in, in the photograph, she's taken a black women and putting, she's put, it's called rewriting history. Oh. And she's mm. taking black women and putting them back in somewhat of like classic Renaissance Renaissance, era, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, situations or, or you know, beautiful um, contexts that you would never see. But what she's done is she she's also a visual artist and a multidisciplinary artist who works with her hands and she makes things. She makes the dresses out of paper. So what you're what? seeing is a dress that it, everything in that photograph is paper. <gasps> so then she takes, <laughs> I know, mine, blown. Just wow. Blown. I'm just imagining the paper cuts from that dress. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That seems painful, but impressive all the same. And then, yeah. then she has the nerve to get her friends and her contemporary artists and friends to come in and model the dresses. Mm-hmm. And then she'll create a little, you know, montage of sort of like a, a, a scenario in which to put them and then photograph them. And then she photographs it too. And then she, she has this unique way of, um, developing it to look like a photo. Wow. So that woman right there, as much as she looks like she's from another time, yeah, she is a backup singer for Lenny Kravitz. Oh, of course she <laughs> what is. What is going on? Oh my Her God. name is Yazara. She's on I... Instagram and she lives in Brooklyn. <laughs> okay. And we we bring up Lenny Kravitz a lot on Bitch we Talk. We do. So a this lot. is just full it's circle. circle. It's full, full circle. circle. You have no idea. I need to go to bed. I just, this is too I much. Love... I have so much to think about right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm so in love with Lenny Kravitz. I, I mean, <laughs> who that is guy. it? But, but yeah. he's just amazing. And, that's, and, and small coincidence here his mother is in our film. His mother is Roxy Roker. 
the, uh, from, she, the from the Jeffersons. Oh, right. Yes. And Wait, she was, where was she? In the very beginning of the film, as we're talking about the beginning of public, public affairs television, what emerges are these sort of public affairs shows that talk to Blacks specifically about what's happening in the news right. in their communities in a positive yes. way. And that's what mm -hmm. Soul emerged from, but it s distinguished itself by being more of a cultural show instead of just a public affairs news show. Uh, so we show a clip from a television co show called Inside Bedford Stuyvesant. Yes. Inside Bed mm -hmm. Stuy. And she was the host. Oh and my she God. was also a friend of Ellis's and she would of also course. come over to our apartment when I was a little girl. Of course. So I, we knew her and we knew her husband. My parents were all hanging out together. So I snuck that in as an homage to her. Oh, I love it. And secretly hoping one day. Yeah, that Lenny. With Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> so will everything you... like, you know, comes around to Lenny Kravitz. Okay, always. But, Melissa, always... will you promise if, if Lenny wants to watch the movie, will you invite us? Please, <laughs> we'll yes. do anything. We'll bring food we, or whatever. As, as long as we can go to Brazil to that crazy ass place he lives in that I saw an Architectural yeah. Digest. Did yes, you see that? yes. yes. Yes, he, he, with the he, surfboard and the, uh, the and also the surfboard abs. Yes, I saw. Yeah, we'll be the, the official the press. We'll yes. be the official press for this event. <laughs> you okay? gotta come in and cover it. Yeah, <laughs> the exclusive. The exclusive. <laughs> All right, 2021's looking better by the minute. Yeah, by <laughs> oh please, can I just get a? Can I just get a? What do I need? An, what do you call oh, an injection? Um, okay, my, vaccine, vaccine. Yes, sorry. sorry yeah, yeah, no. Can I? Get the Lenny Kravitz vaccine, please. Yeah. yeah, yes. I'll take whatever he gives me, really. I'm in. I'm in. So I did write to him because there was a day when he was, when he, he loves her very much, his mother. And he, on Instagram, he put a picture up of her. And I happened to be the first one to see it. So of course I wrote back right away. <laughs> oh, love your mom. And guess what? She's featured in our film, Mr. Soul. Would love for you to see it. Yeah. And he, and he wrote back and said, I'd love to see it. Oh. And I, and I just fell out yeah <laughs> you've been blacked out ever since then. yeah oh my i don't God. remember what happened after that but I'm, i am still <laughs> trying to get him to see the film because i know it will really resonate with him yeah. and so yes his mother, his mother was best friends with diane carroll and they're all in oh, that yeah. same era together mm -hmm. and so diane carroll was really like a mother to him like i think she may be his godmother because when i went to diane carroll's memorial service when she passed away last year mm. um or no actually it was early no it was yeah it was last year um uh he was there and he did a beautiful tribute to her mm. and i was like wow all these worlds colliding you mm -hmm. know the way artists were back then they really had to stick together yeah and and that was important because julia the show julia was the first television show in 1968 that featured a black woman um, mm -hmm. as the lead in that she played the nurse and so we have a clip of that too because yeah. that was happening mm -hmm. when soul was happening and it's crazy to think that that was the first time a black woman could star in a television show and didn't happen again until carrie washington starred in scandal right it was Holy like shit. such a huge gap mm -hmm. huge gap and i'm hoping that a film like this can help show the huge gap and that we can try to compress that gap as we move forward and not have yeah. so many gaps moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I hope that we don't. I mean, we're at a point, I think, this is a real crucial point in our yeah. history. And what we decide to do with it yes. is what's important, right? Yeah, and your How film is gonna help forward. that though. Right. I think it's, it's a bridge. It. Yeah. I really think it's a bridge and many people have fallen in love with it and all kinds of people, you know, not just black folks mm -hmm. and folks who know the period and know the music and know the show, but folks who've never seen it and never mm -hmm. knew about it, mm -hmm. they also feel included and they come out really grateful for having known the story in a way yeah. that doesn't always happen with films. You well, know? the, the we, results speak for itself. I mean, it's doing really well. You're winning awards left and right. I can't even hey. keep up. In the age of, of now video on demand streaming, your film is doing well. Was it three months extended out? Yes. In, um, is it four months now that it's been it's, out still? It's, I it's mean, it's, it's killing it right now. So I'm just so glad for people to see it because it's such yeah. a, you know, it is a dark time and, and we got to give shout out to our first responders and all of our mm -hmm. folks out there who are helping us get through it i do recognize and and you know and 
pay homage to those we have lost. This is a very difficult time and we'll look back on it as such. And so my, I'm hoping that this can be a gift and, and, and we offer it in a sense of healing, you know, because music is healing for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 mm-hmm. it's something that we can all share and all feel go- good about. And I think that's what we have to do now. Figure out what we can all feel good about. The country has been divided. Don't even get me started about the administration. Mm. You know, so mm-hmm. we have to figure out ways to come together. Not to yeah. sound cliche or anything, but whatever well, it takes. Well, Melissa, you have made us feel better. I think this hey. is the beginning of a beautiful relationship, yeah. right, Karen? Oh. I mean, I oh, think I we're you like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for this work, for yeah. spending your time with us today. You've really, the, you, this has been the highlight of my day. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you guys, it's been great. And I'd love to hang out anytime. <laughs> we don't even have to great. record. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sounds we, good. We have a lot of, I think, I, I don't know, I'm speaking for Ange, but we have a lot of questions about filmmaking. So maybe that's oh, a yeah. different conversation. We're in the middle of trying yeah. to finish our first documentary. So <laughs> oh. I was, when, when I heard it took you 10 years to just make this beautiful, wonderful star studded film, I'm like, okay, we're okay. Because ours is not, <laughs> ours is not star studded. So, but it doesn't have to. You know, that's right, just my journey. Right. I would encourage it not to take that long. Thank you for your time. We really, oh. this was so much fun. This was great. So great. Thank you. Yes, yes really appreciate it. And thank oh, you thank so you. much for having me. And yeah. anytime you want to get down, I'm down for it. Take care and be safe and hoping for a better future ahead. Absolutely. <laughs> All around. All right. Appreciate you, Melissa. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank, thank you. you, guys. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show is edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions.